we'll wait a couple of minutes uh, after the hour just to give uh, a chance to more people to join. Welcome uh, everybody to uh, this um, month uh, webinar uh, of the cerebrovascular section of the World Federation. On uh, behalf of myself and um, on my uh, co-moderator, Professor Fujimura, we'd like to welcome uh, you to a, a very informative uh, uh, morning uh, or evening, depending on where you are, on um, uh, cavernous malformations. We have uh, uh, two uh, speakers that uh, will cover um, the general uh, and uh, clinical aspects uh, of uh, this topic, and as well as the surgical aspects. And, um, and then uh, Professor Fujimura will uh, present and uh, we will discuss uh, some uh, cases. The first speaker is uh, uh, Professor Kelly Fleming, a neurologist and professor of neurology here at the Mayo Clinic in uh, Rochester. She is and has been uh, one of the uh, leading uh, figures uh, in the understanding of the natural history and uh, clinical uh, evolution of um, cavernous malformations. Uh, she could not be here with us today for uh, she had another engagement, uh, but uh, she was uh, kind enough uh, to uh, record the video that um, I will uh, um, I will start. And uh, she, we will uh, hear about the overall management of cavernous malformations, uh, particularly with the neurolo neurology point of view. And this are at the level of the capital. I have a few disclosures. So these are the typical questions I might get asked as a neurologist. In the first panel, you see a patient with multiple SWI lesions, and they wonder, are these cavernous malformations, or 
could they be something else like amyloid angiopathy? The second patient wants to know what's the risk of observation, what's the natural history versus what's the risk of surgical intervention in this particular situation. And finally, the third patient wants to know what medications are okay to take and what medications might worsen the natural history. And so these are the typical questions I might get asked. Let's just start with what is a cavernous malformation. A cavernous malformation is composed of multiple endothelial lined caverns, and these are at the level of the capillaries. On a seven Tesla MRI, you can almost envision seeing those individual caverns where some are bright white suggesting subacute blood or thrombosis within a cavern and others are isodense. At the microscopic level, it's the tight junctions that are dysfunctional and the leakiness of the endothelium. And that leakiness can sometimes lead to symptoms. It is not uncommon that some patients are discovered to have a cavernous malformation incidentally, meaning the symptoms are not related to the cavernous malformation. Other patients may present with focal neurologic deficit attributable to the location of the lesion, seizures, or headache. Deficit, seizure, or headache is radiographically associated with hemorrhage. We call it a symptomatic hemorrhage. However, there are patients that have focal neurologic deficits that localize to the location of the cavernous malformation, but there's no obvious radiographic evidence of hemorrhage, and we call them FND, focal neurologic deficit, NOS not otherwise specified, or non-hemorrhagic. And sometimes these may be non-hemorrhagic because the imaging was delayed from the time of the symptoms, or because some people will have seizures without radiographic evidence of hemorrhage but you'll see those words in the nomenclature. Cavernous malformations come in two different types. The sporadic form, typically characterized by a single lesion. The cavernous malformation there is noted by the yellow arrow, often with an associated developmental venous anomaly noted by the red arrow. Sometimes um, the developmental venous anomaly may not be visible on standard sequences like the gadolinium or the SWI, in which case sometimes um, seven Tesla MRI can show it. Um, to the right on the top is a very large developmental venous anomaly. When you see large developmental venous anomalies, sometimes they can be associated with multiple cavernous malformations surrounding that DVA. The lower panel shows the typical familial form. So typically there are more than one lesion and often without a developmental venous anomaly. Sometimes it may be two or three lesions, and as you see in the patient below, sometimes there are more than 50 or even more than 100 lesions. There are three known genes, CCM1, 2, and 3, all are autosomal dominant. The familial form of cavernous malformation also, in addition to the cavernous malformations of the spine and the brain, may have retinal angiomas. They may have these skin lesions, which are characteristic of a a dark purple or black raised areas on the skin. Sometimes they'll have angiomas of the kidneys and the liver and of the vertebral bodies. And CCM3 in particular can also be associated with benign brain tumors. In the familial form, approximately 60% of patients will have a lifetime risk of at least a single seizure and a 40 to 60% chance of at least one bleed. So I'm going to talk about, one, how do we secure the diagnosis of a cavernous malformation and, and make sure it's not something else. Number two, talk a, quite a bit about the natural history and some new data. Um, the treatment options in terms of treating the lesion, I'm going to leave surgical recommendations to Dr. Schur, but I'm going to talk about some of the emerging opportunities for treatment. And then finally, talk about a few comorbid conditions that often come up in discussion with these patients. CT scans are very insensitive for picking up cavernous malformations and especially for picking up any intracavernous hemorrhage. You might see something such as this where there's a hyperdensity on a CT, but many times uh, you don't see much at all. 
And on conventional angiograms, they are typically negative because, again, these lesions are at the level of the capillary. So by and large, the diagnosis is secured by looking for characteristic picture on an MRI scan. The T2 scan often has this characteristic looking lesion that is often likened to popcorn or to a mulberry where there's a reticulated center with a dark area around it, the hemosiderin. And these are always dark um, on SWI or GRE sequences. The T1 generally shows us if there's any subacute hemorrhage and T1 with contrast is really to help us rule out other causes for such a lesion. The cavernous malformations typically are either non-enhancing or mildly diffusely enhancing. The guidelines suggest an MRI is recommended for the diagnosis, um, but that catheter angiography is typically not recommended. And I usually do the first scan with GAD, um, with gadolinium or with contrast to help me make the diagnosis, but once I've secured the diagnosis, uh, follow-up scans do not require gadolinium. We can further break down the cavernous malformations into the Zabramski types. So type 1 is acute hemorrhage, type 2 is that very characteristic looking popcorn appearance, type 3 is isodense to hypo-intense on T2, and type 4 are those that you just see on a hemosiderin sensitive sequence, so like an SWI or a GRE sequence. So type 1 and type 4 lesions have a broader differential diagnosis, whereas that type 2 is very characteristic looking. And so commonly I'm faced with thinking through, is this a cavernous malformation or not when they've acutely hemorrhaged or if you see the multiple SWI lesions, are we sure it's not something else? So a couple helpful tips. If there's a developmental venous anomaly, it really helps because then you can secure the diagnosis. Sometimes a seven Tesla MRI will show that DVA better than a one or three uh, Tesla MRI. The other thing that we've noticed looking at radiographic natural history is the edema that you see with cavernous malformations will uniformly go away after about 90 days unless they rebleed. So if you see persistent edema like you do in um, the patient um, in the center panel with the myxoma or with the renal cell carcinoma, um, those persistent edema over three months would be highly unusual for cavernous malformations. And sometimes it's just really hard to tell in the acute phases of the hemorrhage what is this lesion, but repeating the MRI in six to 12 weeks helps the lesion evolve a little bit more to that characteristic appearance. In the patients with multiple SWI abnormalities, is it cerebral cavernous malformations? Is it amyloid angiopathy? What is it? It's always helpful to look for at least one standard looking or characteristic looking lesion on the T2. If that's not present, you can consider genetic testing. 95% of people with the true familial cavernous malformation syndrome will have an abnormal gene. Sometimes we've done spinal fluid to try to figure out is it amyloid or not. Um, there should be subcortical and cortical lesions in familial CCM versus amyloid is tends to be more cortical. And then also when you look at the um, pattern of the SWI, if it looks unusual, consider a CAT scan because calcium can also look like microbleeds and you may pick up something else. And neurocystis sarcosis is one that has sometimes been mistaken for cavernous malformation. Now we're going to switch to natural history. So what is natural history? It's the usual course or development of a disease in the absence of treatment. And why is it important is because we want to look at what is the bleed risk or recurrent bleed risk compared to what is the risk of a surgical or medical intervention. It used to be we'd look at retrospective natural history assuming that the lesion was present since birth. 
However, we now know that that is not true. And so now we're really focused on this prospective natural history from the time of diagnosis to the time of some future event like symptomatic hemorrhage. If we were to group all the patients together that have cavernous malformation, the incidental group, those with symptoms, we get a, about a risk of two to 3% per year. However, um, we can further stratify this risk with some other features. So this data is from the horn meta-analysis using five cohorts and looking specifically at brainstem location versus non-brainstem location and whether they presented with hemorrhage or no hemorrhage. And what you see here, both in the Kaplan-Meier curve and the associated graph, is that the highest risk of another hemorrhage is those with the brainstem location that initially presented with hemorrhage. Those patients had a 30.8% risk over five years of another hemorrhage. The next highest risk was those with a non-brainstem location that presented with a hemorrhage, and that was about 18.4% over five years. And then those that did not present with hemorrhage had a much lower risk. You can also see that the lines tend to plateau around two and a half years, suggesting the highest risk is in the first few um, years after diagnosis. Now the caveat here being that medium follow-up time in this study was about 3.5 years. Uniformly of the 20 plus probably 30 natural history studies that exist now, uniformly there are consistent risk factors, age less than 45, symptomatic hemorrhage at presentation, and brainstem location. Most studies suggest that those are true. There are smaller studies and limited data that show a number of other features, both clinical and radiographic, that might change the risk of hemorrhage. And then there is some conflicting data. For example, developmental venous anomalies. Some studies say that it does not make a difference with the bleed risk. Some say it does. Some stratify the type of CCM DVA complex, and maybe that makes a difference. But like I said, uniformly, there has been some very consistent data on symptomatic hemorrhage, brainstem location, and age. Despite there being so many natural history studies, we wanted to study this ourselves in a prospective way involving patient input um, and doing it in a contemporary fashion and specifically looking at some specific MRI characteristics at baseline and MRI characteristics in follow-up. And specifically, um, one of our goals was to look at the characteristics on a follow-up MRI done about three months after presentation. Why three months? Well, blood tends to have a specific evolution over time on T1. Oftentimes we see the bright T1 or subacute blood when we see a patient that has had a new focal neurologic deficit or seizure. By one month, this should turn isodense or even dark um, with time on the T1 images. So we specifically wanted to look at a follow-up image that was at least three months after the initial to make sure that we were seeing this evolution of the, the hemorrhage. So what we were particularly interested is in the evolution on the T1, and we saw several patterns emerge, and we grouped these together as a persistent high T1 signal for asymptomatic hemorrhage when we looked at outcomes. So for example, in the top row, this patient presented with acute confusion in November of 2014, and you see these hemorrhagic caverns in the left temporal lobe. Some of the caverns become isodense by January of 2015, but there is one cavern that stays persistently bright. And so that we called persistent high T1 signal. In the lower panel, we see a patient that presented with hemorrhage noted by the green arrow that persists in a bright T1 way on the April 2010 film but also has an asymptomatic new hemorrhage just inferior to it. 
So again, we grouped this finding together when we were looking at outcomes. This is the Kaplan-Meier curve from our data. What you notice is patients with symptomatic hemorrhage at diagnosis, the blue line, have a much higher risk of recurrent hemorrhage than those with no symptomatic hemorrhage at diagnosis, the red line. By five years, the cumulative risk of proportion of patients with a recurrent hemorrhage is 41.2% in the symptomatic hemorrhage at diagnosis group versus 6.1% in the patients presenting without a symptomatic hemorrhage at diagnosis, but remember some of them do have symptoms. In addition to looking at the first prospective symptomatic hemorrhage, we looked at first prospective severe symptomatic hemorrhage. Recall that that is a modified Rankin of three or higher at the time of the hemorrhage. And those numbers were 12.8% in the symptomatic hemorrhage at diagnosis group versus 2.5% in those without hemorrhage at diagnosis. Patients about. When we looked at univariate analysis, the typical things came um, with a positive p-value, age less than 45, symptomatic hemorrhage, brainstem location. We also saw that asymptomatic hemorrhage, increased T1 signal that was persistent, and um, CCM size greater than a centimeter seemed to be significant in univariate analysis. But when we did the final multivariate analysis, symptomatic hemorrhage at presentation and persistent T1 or new T1 signal were the only things that came out in that analysis. So in our data, if they had a symptomatic hemorrhage at presentation, yes, and then an MRI done at least three months later had persistent high T1 signal or new high 1T signal, yes, that was a 50% chance over five years of a bleed versus if they did not have that follow-up characteristic, it was a 19.3% risk. If a symptomatic hemorrhage at presentation, no, to the right side of this algorithm, but they did have the persistent or new high T1 signal, then it was a 4.4% over five-year risk versus a 1.2% risk. And so again, this is another way to stratify your patients once you do that follow-up MRI. And here's a great example of this finding. So this patient in January of 2013 had very severe obsessive compulsive disorder to the point of being hospitalized, and she had not had that before. This lesion that involves the caudate head um, we think was symptomatic, and you can see the hemorrhage. You can see in January of 2014 at the green arrow that there was some persistent high T1 signal, um, even though the major part of the hemorrhage has gone to an isodense appearance. In February 2015, without any new symptoms, she had two areas of what I would consider asymptomatic hemorrhage or intracavernous thrombosis at the blue arrows, and then in late 2018 had uh, a seizure and the MRI was read as stable but indeed there is a new cavern that is bright on T1 suggestive of a symptomatic hemorrhage. We are at Mayo also involved in the CASH biomarker study um, along with the University of Chicago and UCSF and Barrow Neurologic Institute. Dr. Gerard at the University of Chicago is heading this study, looking at certain plasma proteins and microRNA. Can we predict who is gonna hemorrhage in the next year? So wouldn't it be great if the MRI characteristics and the biomarker could help us predict which patients would benefit most from intervention? So moving to treatment options, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about lesional treatment because Dr. Schur, who follows me, is going to talk about surgery, which by and far is what we're talking about with treating the lesion is, are we going to consider surgery or observation? There may be a role for stereotactic radiosurgery in sporadic form cavernous malformations that have bled in a very difficult location to surgically extract. Laser interstitial thermal therapy is an evolving technique often considered for some seizure disorders and superficial lesions, um, again, evolving 
um, data on that, mostly from single center cohort studies. Focused ultrasound, not the thermal um, destructive type of focused ultrasound, but the focused ultrasound that has mechanical disruption is being uh, evaluated as a possible treatment um, at University of Virginia. And I want to touch on some of the medication and lifestyle things that we talk about with patients as a neurologist. So I often start by talking about lifestyle changes that might be useful for patients um, so that they can have some control over this disease. The items along the bottom in purple have very limited data, but it makes sense to limit alcohol, stop smoking, identify and treat sleep apnea, and treat high blood pressure. Along the top, we talk about vitamin D. There's indirect evidence that lower vitamin D is associated with bleeding compared to higher levels. No clinical trial evidence as to whether vitamin D supplementation is helpful, but has low risk and might be considered. There is data on the gut microbiome and a diet free with processed foods that might um, be something that you can talk to patients about. And there's more information on the Alliance to Cure website. And then we talk about which medications might be safe and even beneficial and which medications might have a deleterious effect on the cavernous malformation. And I will mention those shortly. What's really exciting is that we're learning more and more about what the CCM complex does and how it regulates the endothelial leakiness and the tight junctions. In particular, I want to point out something called Rho A and ROC. That's where we think that a torvastatin acts. And Rho A and ROC uh, modulate the endothelial leakiness. By knowing a lot of these different targets, it has allowed us to develop potential targets for various therapeutics. And the goal is that could we reduce the risk of bleeding? Could we reduce the risk of new lesion formation through medications rather than surgical intervention? So three important clinical trials to pay attention to and look for upcoming. The CASH EPOC trial, a tour of statin 80 milligrams daily versus placebo in patients with recent clinical symptomatic hemorrhages. Results anticipated late this year or early 2025. The TREAT CCM trial was an open label phase two pilot trial in familial cavernous malformation patients. 83 patients were randomized two to one to either propranolol, uh, low dose and escalated versus placebo. And there are a lot of ongoing um, data gonna come out of this trial in the initial pilot there was a slight reduction risk of hemorrhage with two events in each group, um, but a slightly lower hemorrhage risk in that therapeutic group. Finally, the Sycamore trial uh, anticipated results sometime later this year. Tempol is an antioxidant. We'll look forward to hearing this phase two trial result. So now I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking about some of the comorbid conditions patients ask us about. Specifically, patients will commonly ask us about using aspirin or NSAIDs or blood thinners. We get asked about pregnancy not infrequently. We get asked about what medications could be deleterious. Um, and we often get asked about headaches. And I don't have time to review all of these things with you. And so I'm going to briefly talk a little bit about the antithrombotic data and the female hormone data that might impact your patients. In a study that we participated in along with four other centers, we were interested in what is the risk of antithrombotics so you would think per, that blood thinners would increase the risk of bleeding, but in fact, what we saw is those patients using antithrombotics, so the 253 of 1,342 patients had a lower risk of bleeding from the cavernous malformation than those not on antithrombotics. So a 0.5% per year risk of bleeding versus a 2.4% per year risk of bleeding and that was 
statistically significant even after adjusting for brainstem location, age, and presentation with hemorrhage. Now, the majority of patients in this study were aspirin. Um, there were very few on things like Plavix and Berlenta, and very few on DOAX. Um, so largely, this was a, a study looking at aspirin. So again, paradoxically, blood thinners reduce the risk, and I'm going to come back to that concept shortly. In this study, we were interested in the effects of female hormones, specifically progesterone and estrogen, on the risk of bleeding. We combined data from Mayo Clinic with that in the Essen Germany group of females that we had longitudinal data on. And we looked at those that had taken female hormones and those that had not taken female hormones and looked at what was the risk of cavernous malformation hemorrhage. And we found a higher risk of hemorrhage, 7.4% per year, and those who had taken some type of female hormone versus 5.1% and those not taking female hormones. When you looked at patients taking female hormones versus never hormones, the risk of cavernous malformation hemorrhage was 1.6 times higher in the female hormone group. When you looked specifically at oral contraceptives versus never hormones, the risk of cavernous malformation hemorrhage was two times higher. And when you combined oral contraceptives and tobacco use, it was 4.9 times higher. When we looked at all menopausal hormones, no matter what the formulation or the delivery system, there wasn't a significant difference. But when we looked at oral estrogen in particular, um, that seemed to be more significant. So what is this paradox where antithrombotics reduce the risk, but estrogens and potentially progesterones increase the risk? Well, the concept is similar to that of cerebral venous thrombosis where when you have normal blood flow going from the arteries to the capillaries to the veins, the blood is not clotting. Um, but if you put a cavernous malformation there and the blood is not moving as quickly as it would, and maybe you add something like estrogen, which increases clotting risk, then maybe one or two of those caverns clots and the blood can't escape to the venous side, so it escapes to the brain. Um, so that theory would make sense why aspirin or antithrombotics might reduce the risk of cavernous malformation hemorrhage, whereas um, estrogens in particular might increase the risk. So coming back to the female hormone question, so female hormones might increase the risk of cavernous malformation hemorrhage because of that estrogen increasing the clotting risk. And estrogen does so in a dose-dependent manner, which may be why we see oral contraceptives having a higher risk than menopausal estrogens. And often when estrogen is combined with other factors, like if a patient had factor V or if they were on tobacco, that may further increase the risk. Progesterone is an interesting concept as well because there is basic science data suggesting that the CCM complex um, is negatively affected by progesterone and, and that may also uh, produce bleeding and or leakage from cavernous malformations. I consider the data on female hormones is very exploratory. There's literally 250 different formulations of female hormones, and they come in different types, oral, injectables, intrauterine devices, transdermal, transvaginal. And so we need to further hone in on which patients are at highest risk and which specific formulations might be the highest risk. Until then, I urge caution, depending on the patient's individual situation and need for the hormones. We look at have they bled recently? Have they had recent growth? How many lesions do they have? And try to take into consideration all those factors until we learn more.
And very quickly, I'm looking forward to the updated Alliance to Cure guidelines, which will come out later this year or early next year. The familial cavernous malformation article was updated in the past year. I'm looking forward to the outcomes of the CASH EPOC trial, the Sycamore trial, and the ongoing uh, treat CCM and CARE trials. And there continues to be this evolution of basic science and more potential targets for therapeutics, and it's a very exciting time. And I'd quickly like to thank my Mayo collaborators, um, especially Dr. Lanzino, for all of his expertise and help both clinically and on research, and to my external collaborators, including Dr. Schur, Phil, Philip Damon, and Alejandro Santos. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you, uh, Dr. Fleming, for, uh, as usual, a very extensive and comprehensive um, uh, overview. Um, I'd like just to uh, reiterate and stress a few basic concepts that um, have been uh, uh, discussed in their presentation. The difference between the sporadic and the familial form, and the fact that uh, in the familial form, uh, we don't see associated developmental venous um, anomalies because, of course, the mechanism is related to a genetic predisposition rather than probably alter the venous outflow like in the sporadic, uh, uh, sporadic form. The uh, concept that is uh, common to most uh, vascular conditions that uh, if a patient uh, has presented uh, with the symptomatic event, particularly hemorrhage, the risk of re-hemorrhage over time is uh, fairly high. And uh, as we have heard uh, in our prospective registry, the cumulative risk of five years uh, is uh, over uh, 40%. Important to consider, though, that despite this uh, fairly high risk of uh, further bleeding, the incidence of bleeding leading to dependence, so disabling bleeding, is uh, mu it's much lower, and it's about uh, 12, uh, 13 percent. This is a very important concept to consider, especially when we decide which patients we should submit to surgery, especially in the deep-seated lesions. As we know, many patients, they often recover to a very good level without treatment after a first symptomatic bleed. And it's often the transition from a second to a third bleed where the um, um, disabling uh, event uh, can happen. And uh, the last uh, very important and intriguing uh, thing I like to uh, stress is this evolving concept that um, antithrombotic medications like aspirin in particular, they might actually decrease the risk of bleeding in a patient with uh, a, um, cavernous malformations. Of course, so this is not something that we recommend. There are uh, ongoing uh, efforts to start uh, prospective trials, but I think especially for the young colleagues, it's important to consider like something that might be at first uh, counterintuitive, uh, uh, might turn uh, to be uh, the one of the po potentially an important uh, pharmacological intervention. And uh, lastly, I would like to say that uh, after operating and seeing uh, several hundred patients with cavernous malformations, I came to the conclusion that uh, anybody who says that they can understand